So yeah. now you speak in Fortune 500 companies. The people who listen to you have multiple years of experience doing whatever they're doing. And you've come from somewhere who have worked in corporates only for a year or two. And you give them lectures and, you know, make them do something and you kind of successfully do it. Do you ever feel that as an imposter there? Because you personally don't have that much of experience to the people you're teaching, right? Mm. How do you deal with that, if at all it comes up? That, that's, that's a really good question. This is probably um, one, of the, one of the most interesting podcast questions. Thank you. Because it sounds... It sounds like a tricky question, but it's not. And the simple answer is no, I don't feel like an imposter. Simple reason is that. Welcome back to another episode of the Being Yourself Show, where world's renowned thought leaders and best-selling authors share their wisdom and insight with you so that you can achieve your goals and be more productive. I'm your host, Ajay Mathur, and my guest today is Udemy's top coach and partner, Mind Valley's top speaker and an entrepreneur and avid traveler. He has over 350,000 number of students on Udemy alone. And this number changes almost every day because last time when I read about this number, it was 310,000. Anybody can create course, but Jimmy's courses on Udemy have got an average of 4.7 stars. And he's got nearly 66 or 67,000 reviews for his courses. So it's really top notch. Uh, coach. He has traveled over 78 countries. Now, this number again keeps changing. The most recent one that I know from when I met him in AFEST a couple of months ago was 70, and now it is 78. So, he has traveled over 78 countries. We will figure out what does he do on these trips. His courses have received multi multiple mentions by publications such as Forbes, Entrepreneur, and Business Insider. So, I'm so excited to welcome someone who is one of the most charismatic speaker I have met, Jimmy Narain. Jimmy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Hey, I appreciate it. I just want to say, uh, we talked a little bit before recording and uh, we talked about uh, saying yes or no to podcast requests. And I said to you that the way I try to figure out if I'm going to do a podcast or not is because of the energy of the person, right? If I, if I vibe well with a person, if I see good intention, then I always say yes. And when I met you at AFEST, I, I just love the way you came up to me after my speech with a big smile, with positive energy. And you said, hey, you know, thank you for the speech. This is what I got out of it. You even made a short video where you told people some of your biggest takeaways. So you clearly paid attention to what I was saying. You were not just, you know, sharing empty words. And then you asked me, hey, can we do a podcast together? Of course, I said yes. And I'm happy that we are doing it today. Thank you, Jimmy. And thank you for mentioning that. I'll put that video link here. So if somebody wants to know what Jimmy has told about creating human connections, showing their vulnerabilities and everything, then do watch out. It's a short four minutes video. So Jimmy, before I go deep into your journey, I want to know, and I've, I've heard it in one of your interview that you love seeing people transforming. I want to know where this has come from. What is your mm -hmm. inspiration? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And this is actually the reason why I do what I do, right? So, so, you know, a lot of people, when they see me nowadays on different stages, they see me doing podcast interviews, they see me filming various videos and corporate training. It's easy to assume, okay, it's easy for this guy because he's confident, right? He, he is a, a legitimate speaker. So it's easy for him, but it's not easy for other people. What a lot of those individuals don't know is that I used to struggle with confidence issues, with anxiety. I even had panic attacks. In fact, one time I run away from a stage 12 years ago. So I know how terrible it feels, how debilitating it feels to have anxiety, to not have confidence, to you know, hear your teachers and, and people in your environment telling you, oh, you have those dreams? Are you kidding me? Forget about them. It's not possible. You are a poor kid from Poland. You'll never make it happen. Okay, so, so I know how it feels to go from that mindset of, wow, no one really believes that my dreams are possible to the point where I don't even believe in them anymore. But then transforming your life completely. I've been doing this over and over again, reinventing myself. So I know it is possible. I know that you don't just have to accept the reality that you have right now. You can actually, as Vishen actually says, you can bend it to your will. You can design the life you want to have and then figure out how to get it and then go after it and make it happen. So the reason I'm passionate about helping people to transform is because, again, I know that feeling when you feel stuck, when you feel like there is no hope. And I know for a fact, no one will tell me otherwise, that no matter what, what your situation is, you can transform. There is always a way to transform in whatever way. 
And this is why I want to empower people who don't have that hope or who don't have the tools or who don't have the right mindset or strategies. I want to help those people to see the light and to realize, you know what, actually you are the creator of your life. You're not just some passive uh, little, uh, I don't know the name, you know, the, this thing that you use for, for chess. Um, you see, this is where my Polish pawn. background comes in. English is not my first language. What is the name of those little things? Pawn, pawn. Yeah, pawn, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're not just this pawn passively pushed around by life. You can actually take control. You can design your life. So this is where it comes from. And I, I, I know what it did to me, taking full control of my life. And I also know how incredible it feels when you help other people to transform and to see that there are other possibilities out there. When you see the smile on their face, when you see that they legitimately can't believe that it's happening, that it is possible, it, it's an addictive feeling, I have to say. Mm. And Jimmy, I know about you that you don't stay anywhere for longer than two to three weeks. And you have seen, now now guys, this thing, every time I've watched some content of Jimmy, he's given different number of how many countries he has traveled <laughs> because it is kind of keep on increasing as fast as his ratings of his courses are increasing. This is amazing. Uh, the most recent interview I read, it was 70 countries, but now Jimmy told me before the interview that it is 78 now and he's in a different country right now. My question to you, Jimmy, then is, Everybody's got 24 hours, right? You, me, mm -hmm. and all of us, rest of the world. And you spend half of that traveling. <laughs> <laughs> and on top of that, you have created one of the best course, score, well, not one, but many of the courses on Udemy. You are a Udemy partner. You're amazing. One of the most charismatic speaker I have ever met. That's you. I How appreciate you that. that. Thank and you. you. And you have a company. You're an entrepreneur. How do you do all this? How do you manage? And with such a great quality, so many things. That's that's a very big question, man. But let me let me attempt to answer it. <laughs> different, okay, different ways to go about it. There are different angles we could talk about. Um, when you said okay, you travel half of the time. I know you, you said it half seriously, half jokingly. But a lot of people think, well, when you travel so much, you have to deal with logistics all the time, and mm -hmm. it must be really difficult. And yes, it takes a lot of time and energy, and changing time zones, and looking for the right accommodation, and finding the wife, and all of that. That takes time, but like with anything, when you do it for long enough, you just learn certain hacks, right? So I've learned how to hack the system and nowadays logistics that would cause a headache for a regular person are just my bread and butter, right? So the way um, people take buses, that's how taking planes works for me. And it's not, not just because, you know, it's me, it, it would happen to anybody who traveled that much. So over time, when you travel a lot, you learn some of those hacks mm -hmm. to make it a bit smoother. Now, in terms of using the time effectively, I feel like there's a big difference between time management and actually being productive. So you see a lot of people, they, they just focus on managing their time. But if you manage the wrong things, it doesn't automatically make them really important. So I feel like we nowadays have this disease of trying to be busy for the sake of being busy, right? Constantly shuffling papers and, and chasing that feeling of, I feel like I'm doing something important without necessarily accomplishing big things. So in my life, and it wasn't always like this, by the way, it wasn't always like this, but I really try to constantly keep brainwashing myself that is not just about how much effort I put in. It's not just about hard work. By the way, people often say, oh, it's just about hard work. If it was just about hard work, I've met plenty of people in places like Tanzania, like uh, Cambodia, like Vietnam, right? Like a lot of other places that are working extremely hard and they are not making enough money. So it's mm. not just about working hard. Yes, you got to work hard, but you have to also find the right opportunities. So for me, it's about leverage. It is about looking and creating leverage in your life. So rather than just looking at your to-do list and kind of sleepwalking through it and assuming, okay, this is, by the way, I'm using, this is a funny thing that just happened. I'm using this AI <laughs> camera and this is a new camera, right? So this is, this is funny. This, <laughs> so it reacts to different movements of my hands. And I made some movement now, and it, you notice how it zoomed I in? Can see I kind of it. like it. I'm I always want to stay like this. It's better than it was before. I try not to move my arms too much. I usually gesticulate a lot. But here's the thing. So I feel like, you know, rather than kind of sleepwalking through that to-do list and just, just assuming that everything is equally important, what you want to do is you want to create a situation where you are conscious and you ask yourself, okay, what is the most important thing? If I could only do one or two things, what, which one of those things would make everything else so much easier? Which one of the things would create most leverage in my life? And a lot of us don't do it. So, you know, as I travel, as I do a lot of different things, I try to use that leverage. So then sometimes one activity, if executed properly, it can give you more than literally hundred different activities. One proper partnership 
can give you more than 20 other partnerships. And a good example is, for instance, a partnership with Mindvalley, right? So I have a partnership. I have a course with them. I have a quest with Vision. We co-created it. And now I get a lot of requests from different companies. They say, hey, Jimmy, let's create online courses together, jump on our platform. Let's do this. Let's do that. I couldn't possibly say yes to all of them. But here's the thing. Even saying yes to 15 of them would probably give me less results in terms of exposure, but also in terms of fun of doing it than yeah. one product with mind value. So I feel like in life, it's about picking your shots correctly. For instance, what you are doing with the podcast, this is a, a good example. You mentioned before when we talked privately, you mentioned Eric Edmeets, who's an amazing speaker, great guy, really great, very charismatic guy, right? He's kind of like this uncle that everyone wishes they have. Mm -hmm. So you got Eric on your podcast very early, right? Uh, you mentioned fifth episode, you get Eric Edmeets. Yeah. There are a lot of people out there who would wait till episode 120 to try to get Eric, to try to get Linda, to try to get me, to try to get, get a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. But you clearly found the courage to just ask, right? Like at AFES, you asked me, but I know you asked a lot of other people. Sure, some of them say no, but some of them say yes. And a podcast with one person that has an audience can give you more leverage than doing 20 podcasts just with a bunch of friends mm -hmm. that make you feel comfortable yeah. but are not pushing that comfort zone, right? So that's a good example of leverage that you've been implementing. Um, and I feel like everyone should really view their productivity through that lens. What is one thing that can make everything else easier? Mm. That's a very uh, different answer to the question, actually, which is really cool. Uh, and, uh, and you mentioned about, you know, uh, being busy and then people are like, everybody is busy being busy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has become some sort of... Uh, if, if I tell somebody that I am not busy, you know, I have nothing to do, the people will feel like, oh, really? You know, what kind of <laughs> life you're living? Is it deep yeah. that uh, it has created some sort of chemical imbalance in people's head that telling that you are busy is something nice? Yeah, it's, you know, I remember this from my Goldman Sachs days. So those of you who don't know me, I used to work for Goldman Sachs back in the day that was uh, over 10 years ago. And I worked for Allianz as well. And, you know, uh, I'm listen, I'm not... I'm not trying to now say bad things about those companies. This happens in all big companies, to be frank with you. But it's kind of funny to me that whenever I would go to this little coffee corner to get some coffee, get some tea, I would meet my coworkers and I would ask them, you know, we have a little moment here, two, three minutes to relax, to forget about the deadline, to forget about that big payment or that big issue. You're making yourself some coffee, relax. So I'll say, hey, how was your weekend, Graham? Hey, uh, Joanna, how, how, how is your day going? Man, I'm telling you, 90% of the time, the first default answer was, oh, wow, it's busy, man. It's really busy. And I'm thinking, tell me something I don't know, yeah. right? So yes, it is happening. And I've seen it there. And also in the circle of entrepreneurs, it's, it doesn't happen that much. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, it seems like they take pride in being busy. It's almost like exactly. a metric of, hey, are you being lazy or are you, are you actually getting something done? I feel like this is one of the diseases of the 21st century because, again, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. just because you're busy doesn't mean you're getting the right things done. Okay. Oftentimes, being busy is just a mask for not being productive. Why is that? Well, because oftentimes, being productive means doing uncomfortable things, doing scary things, doing complex things. My example of you trying to get people who have audiences on your podcast early on that's a good example. That is uncomfortable. You coming up to speakers after a fest and asking them for a, a podcast, that is uncomfortable. It's very easy to have that on your list and keep moving it down the line and keep focusing on the easy things. Like in your case, at a fest, you could focus on, okay, I have those 20 things on my list. One of them is to ask those people for a podcast, but you know what? I also have to make an Instagram post. Then the next thing, you know, most people find themselves doing those Instagram posts, but they actually are not moving the needle, right? Mm -hmm. So I feel like, yes, it is important to snap out of that mindset and to get brutally honest with ourselves. And let you, when we, because oftentimes it has to do with procrastination. So when we ask ourselves, when we, when we realize that we are maybe not doing what we should be doing, we got to be honest and ask ourselves, am I not doing those important things because I'm secretly afraid, because I feel discomfort, because I'm afraid of rejection or failure, of the pain of the process, and just be brutally honest with yourself. And if that's the case, if you realize, yes, I am afraid, or yes, it is too complex, what you got to do is you just break it down. You break it down. Okay, this is too complex. Break it down into five smaller steps and make a decision that you'll take the first step just like this right away. Right? If it feels scary, again, break it down. And instead of focusing on the fear of doing that thing, ask yourself, okay, how much regret will I feel if I don't do it? Again, back to your example. You know, you're at AFES and you're afraid to walk up to someone. And then you ask yourself, okay, this is scary. 
how terrible is going to feel to be on a plane back home knowing that I wanted to ask person X or person Y for a podcast and I didn't do it. So now you focus on that pain of regret and suddenly you pain of regret because, because bigger than the pain of taking action and bam, that's, that's when you snap yourself out of your head into your body, you make a move and you make it happen. And when you are kind of, when you're connected with somebody's energies and then you're kind of going and asking them, you mentioned about, you know, coming out, coming out of your comfort zone and just taking action and uh, ask people. I think I connected with everybody who I heard in that particular event. And mm -hmm. I've spoken to all of the speakers individually. Wow. All of the speakers. And uh, many of them have already been on the show. Some are in the pipeline. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's really great. And this many questions do ask me, you know, how do you, it's because some of the guests on the show have been really, really uh, known people. And mm -hmm. this question has been asked very often, you know, how do you find our guests? And I'm like, dude, I don't know. I just ask, you know, simple. You just ask. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's good you bring this up because I feel like um, I have to mention this because this, if, you know, if someone listening to this, if, if you are listening to this and I'm talking to the viewer now. If, if you are struggling with making something happen, like your life is not where you want it to be, mm. the chances are you may be shooting yourself in the foot by not asking, by not taking that little step. What oftentimes happens, um, and this happens with, for instance, applying for jobs as well, yes. right? A lot of people see that amazing job listing, this big startup. Actually, I said big startup. doesn't really work to get anyhow. <laughs> sounds funny. But that successful startup, I should have said, um, is looking for some, some type of people. And you see this amazing position. They pay well and they give you so many opportunities. And maybe the person who started is some type of celebrity and you love that person. Okay, great. Will you apply? Most people entertain the idea in their heads, but they will not apply because they are afraid that it's not going to work out. So guess what? Now you're shooting yourself in the foot. You have zero probability that is going to happen. And sometimes it's literally about taking an impulse. And, you know, sometimes I myself have those situations. I think we all do. When we have an idea, maybe I should talk to that person. Maybe I should do X, Y, and Z. And then we just don't do it. We talk ourselves out of it. Like for instance, you know, you walk by the beach. I'm here in Tenerife. By the way, it's extremely hot. For those, you know, I'm sweating because it's probably 35 degrees here. And unfortunately we don't have AC in this house I'm renting. Um, just just this, this little thing that I cannot use because of the sound. Um, but for instance, you, you are walking by the beach in the evening and it's getting a bit more chilly, you know? And, and you feel this urge, you wanna jump into the water. How many of us would talk ourselves out of it? Nah, man, you, you know, you don't really have swimming stuff on you. Then you have to take a shower, you have to change. Hey, this is life. You have to experience life. So I have those situations where I do the most bizarre things because I have an impulse and I know it's gonna to contribute to my experience. So if I walk by the beach, I'm, I'm, I'm by some promenade, I'm in a restaurant, we are just finishing dinner and there's this beautiful ocean or sea, right? And I feel like I really want to jump in there. There's not many, there's no rip currents and it looks so inviting. Before I even talk myself out of it, sometimes not always, I'll take off my clothes and I just get in. And whenever I do those things, I'm always happy. The other day, there's a, do you follow UFC? AJ, do you, do you, do you like UFC? Okay, it's, it's, it's so it's um, ultimate fighting championships. It's, okay. uh, you know, basically it's cage fighting, right? There's one guy I like, a uh, the, the lot, of, lot of fighters that I, I uh, admire. For, for what they do, um, for their mental strength and perseverance. There's one guy called Michael Chandler. And I've seen some of his videos and he's very eloquent, right? Like extremely eloquent, the way he talks. He could be, he could be a lawyer, he could be a motivational speaker, he could be a, a business owner, he could be doing so many different things. And on an impulse, I noticed he's doing more and more podcasts, right? He's getting out there and I could sense he wants to get out there. So on an impulse, right? I, without talking myself out of it, I took my phone. I, I got him on Instagram, right? And instead of just sending a regular message, I, I actually sent a message, kudos, man, right? And then I sent an audio. I just said, hey, Michael, the one and only Michael Chandler is Jimmy Narain here. Listen, I just want to tell you kudos for everything that you're doing. You're a very inspiring guy. I just want to let you know, listen, I, I've been building online courses for many years, have these many people on board. I certainly don't know everything, but I've learned a thing or two on my journey. If you ever want to build a course, no strings attached, I'm, I, I would love to help you. Just let me know and you know, I'm, I'm happy to provide any advice and, and help you figure it out because it looks like you could be doing that. Guess what? I got a response, an audio, right? And he said, hey man, yeah, well, thank, thank you for the message. Send me an audio, said, listen, I have this big fight, huge fight, right? 
um, I think 12 of November. After that fight, let's link up and we're going to talk. Yeah, maybe there's something, you know. And I've done this so many times. Harry Mack, freestyle rapper, same thing I did to him. We had a bunch of calls. You know, I, I said, listen, if you want to, you know, push it in terms of building a course, I, I'm going to help you out. No strings attached. And, and yeah, we jumped on a few calls. We became buddies. He came to Barcelona to do a show recently. We met in person. Awesome. Um, there's a Navy SEAL, Remy Adeleke, wrote a great, incredible book, right? And this guy, he doesn't normally do podcasts. He, he does mostly television or only very big podcasts. Same thing. I had an impulse, popped him an audio message. And afterwards, he said something in the line of, he, he sent me a message back. He said, listen, man, normally I don't say yes to podcast requests, but the way you did it, like the way you talk and the fact that you sent me an audio and you made it succinct and you made it about me, man, I'm going to say yes to you. Let's, let's do it. And we did it. And we had a great conversation, right? So again, sometimes this is, this is the podcasting world, but this applies to anything, anything in life, whatever you want to do. Sometimes you got to ask you starting a new business, starting a social media agency, what is holding you back from going to a networking event or even better go, go to a place where business owners hang out, not a typical event, but places where people don't have their shield up and just talk to people, just introduce yourself. You know, start a little conversation here and there at some point. Tell them, hey, by the way, my name is Jimmy. You know, I have a social media agency. What, what, what is your business? But talk to people. Worst thing, worst thing that can happen is they're going to tell you, you know, I don't want to talk about business or, uh, you know, I'm too busy. Right. But that's how you, you try to understand the dynamic and you know where you can enter, where you can push it and when you shouldn't be doing it. And listen, you talk to someone, you never know what's going to come out of it. I feel like way too many times we are shooting ourselves in the foot. Yeah, and I don't know who has said it, but 80% success is showing up, right? Hmm. Oh, 100%, I agree with that. Hmm. I think, that, you know, the funny thing is there are those sayings out there that oftentimes we attribute to one person, but um, my, so my theory is that a lot of those sayings were created by a lot of people at the same time, yeah. right? Because they're universal truths. It's like, it's almost mm -hmm. like some sayings are so universal that it's almost, it would be weird to put someone's name next to that quote. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I, I met people, like I, I, all this traveling, I met people in Thailand and in Brazil and in Colombia, and all types of places, in Moldova and Transnistria, Eastern Europe. Um, I met regular people who don't read a lot of books and who live normal lives and they work hard and they come up with those things, right? Like you talk to the old guy and he speaks in broken English and he will drop a bomb. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, this is mm. like, this is golden, you know? So anyhow, I wanted to mention this. Man. I, I, I just started smiling because uh, one of the quote from Albert Einstein uh, just came to my uh, mind. Do you want to hear that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So Einstein once said that 90% of quotes that people say, I said, I didn't say them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's funny. Yeah, I have to say, I have to say, man, whenever someone quotes Einstein, I always chuckle to myself because I know exactly what you're talking about. It's always funny, you know? <laughs> okay. Also, uh, Jimmy, you mentioned about motivation. And when you were talking about it, I wanted to, I wanted to really interrupt, uh, but I have back. Motivation, my personal call on motivation is you can watch, you can binge watch motivational videos, but the problem with them is it's got a very short lifespan. So whatever yeah. you listen or hear or watch motivational thing, until you take an action, to whatever you've heard, you are going to forget it sooner than anything else. It's like, and it's lots of, lots of time people spend on watching, uh, I don't know, whoever is their favorite motivational speaker, but if they don't do anything, it's just as good as watching Netflix. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think um, I think oftentimes what happens, it's like mental masturbation. That's what it is, really, because oftentimes, and I had this many times, and, and this is a pattern, right? Uh, you, you talk to a bunch of people um, and or you're doing a live video on Instagram, for instance, and someone is asking you, hey, how do I stop procrastinating? And you just want to say, and sometimes I say this, I'm like, listen, the way you do it is you stop watching this live video and you just start doing whatever it is that you were supposed to do. Often as we already have the answers, we know what we should be doing. And it's almost as if by watching something, we feel like we are taking action. We are doing something. We feel like the action of watching something is result in itself. And that's why I always tell people, when we talk about productivity, I always tell people, well, what you want to do by the end of the day, you literally want to look back and ask yourself, what are the tangible accomplishments? Like, what have I really accomplished today? And, and, and you know, sure, it's, it's, it's awesome to feel great during the day. That's part of living a good life, right? You want to optimize for also feeling good. But what have you accomplished? 
And whenever you can't figure it out, whenever you feel like you are busy, but you can't really pinpoint something you accomplished, man, like you got to change something. Another thing, and this is powerful, and I use this all the time. You know, whenever, especially whenever I have, because we all have those days, we all have those weeks, when you don't feel that good, right? Don't feel that motivated, that driven. And uh, I like to ask myself, if I kept living my life the way I've been living the last week, if we could took, take, if we could take the last week and multiply it by 50 or 100 or 200, where would I be in one, two, three, four, five years from now? And if the answer is, well, I wouldn't be further away than where I am right now, that's when I know I got to change something, right? And, and that's why initially at the beginning of this podcast, I mentioned it's important to find leverage and to, to tap into what scares you. Do those things that are scary, may seem complicated, but you can break them down. When you break them down, they're not so scary, not so complicated. This is so important. This is fundamental. Also, when you talk about motivation, I feel like motivation, it is important. It is important, right? Ideally, you want to cultivate it, but you want to act upon it very quickly and you want to be driven. The difference between, in my book, the drive and motivation is that motivation is very short term. You get pumped up, right? You, uh, you, know, you saw a quick motivational speech. You saw a snippet, right? About somebody who overcame the odds. Great. But the drive is connected to your vision, to, to your why, to what you want to create in this world. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, I have those moments when I hear someone, I'm like, wow, this really motivates me. But you know what drives me? What drives me is when I get messages from my audience and pe people send me a message, hey, listen, I did your, I did your course pro with Vision and it's already changing the way I run my business. I'm already in the process of building a course. Or someone says, hey, I watched your confidence course and I already feel way better. I have less anxiety. I start recognizing that I'm good enough as a human being. Those things, they drive me because I realize, okay, there is value in what I do. It is important work. I need to do more of it if I want to have more impact. This is where the drive comes from. And this is why, unfortunately, a lot of people you know, are not driven because they haven't taken the time to define what is important to them and how they will contribute to this planet. I feel like this is one of the most important things to do. Also for productivity, because guess what? If you don't know where you want to be, if you don't have a strong mission that really fuels you with this energy, with power, with drive, when you don't have that, I mean, it's very hard to be productive. Why? Because you don't even know where you are heading. You don't know where you are heading. How can you design the journey? How can you, you know, sometimes, okay, here, we are in Tenerife right, right now. Man, I have those moments almost every day where I, I literally I wake up 4.35 in the morning. You know, I can't sleep. I wake up and it's not about insomnia. I wake up and I'm like, I just want to get out there. The sun is not even up. I want to get out there, man. I'm, I'm excited. I know what I'm going to do. I know the journey I'm in. I'm, I'm, I feel passionate about what I do. It's almost like sleep is important. Don't get me wrong. I, I, tr I try to optimize my sleep. And this is a completely different conversation about biohacking. But it's almost like, man, like there's so much I want to do. I'm so pumped up. I want to help so many people. Bam, let's go out there. Right? My girlfriend is still in bed, right? She's like deep, deep in sleep. She has some dreams and I just pop out and I go on a terrace, you know, and I breathe in and I get started. That's, this is what drives us. That's very insightful. And I'm like, I'm just listening and listening. And okay, keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be, I want to be, we talked, we joked about it before the, the podcast, like, you know, I, I can go on very long rants, yeah. you know, uh, so I try to, okay. I try to close the loops so we can, so I have to give an opportunity to ask various questions. Of course. Okay. All right. So there are a few points on this. Uh, first of all, if somebody who is uh, curious about what Jimmy's talking about with the vision and the course pros, so that's a mind valley quest that Jimmy and vision have created together. I've gone through it uh, from start to finish. It's really nice if you Appreciate get it. your own course and you want to put it on Udemy or something. So is Jimmy has given steps on how to put it on Udemy, but you can, you can put it on your whatever learning management system you are following. So yeah, that's a good place to check it. Um, other than that, uh, with regards to uh, uh, taking, with regards to motivation and, uh, you know, you were talking about planning in future and they recently Listen to one of the podcasts, somebody was talking about, if you don't know what are you going to do in next one hour, your life is not on track. I found it hmm. really powerful. I agree and disagree at the same time. Go on. <laughs> okay, so on the one hand, it, okay, if you are in the middle of your work day, 
right? Or, or your work period, because I don't necessarily be believe in work days, right? You, you can have the sprinting periods, for instance, of the work. Sure, you got to know what you are doing. But I also believe in, as I said, sprinting. When you sprint, you, you cannot sprint, right? I'm talking about physical sprinting. You can't sprint for two hours. Mm. No, you sprint and then you have to walk, you rest. I actually did sprinting last night around the beach here. So yeah, you sprint and then you walk a little bit. Your heart rate goes a little bit lower and then you sprint again, right? Um, I believe in mindfulness. I'm a big meditator. I've been meditating for many years now, probably six, seven years. Well, man, not well, many for me. Let, let's put it this way. I know there are people out there who've been doing it for 20, 30 years, but it changed my life. I, I believe in being here and now. I believe that there are different currencies in life, not just making money. Uh, one of them is obviously health, relationships, uh, mobility, freedom. One of them is just a peace of mind. That's, that's one of the currencies. So um, I do believe that sometimes to go faster, you have to slow down. Because when you slow down, you can be way more precise. Slow down, you're precise. When you're precise and smooth, well, that helps you. That helps you to actually go faster. So, so that, that quote you mentioned, the, the, what that person said, I, with that context, whatever, you know, yeah. if they were talking in the context of work, of course, it makes sense. But yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't always mean, uh, Jimmy, that uh, you keep doing something. It's just that you need to be aware of what you're going to spend your time on. It might be just taking rest. It might be just doing something, meditation or relaxing or walking, for example, in the sprint. Yeah. So yeah, what... so this, yeah, this, yeah, I, I agree with this. I agree with this, right? And I'm, I'm saying this, uh, I picked up on that because, um, and I know this is probably not what that person was trying to convey, but I noticed that nowadays, and I'm curious what you think about it, actually. Um, but I noticed that there is this propensity for people to get into this hustle mode all the time. Hustle culture. Hey, got to work 24-7. Hey, if you, you, know, if you want to be successful, don't spend the time with your family, right? Like eliminate all friends who you know, are not successful. Those types of extremes, I see this message being pumped out there. And I disagree with it. I, I feel like, yes, you know, yes, sometimes you got to hustle. And you got to push things. But again, as I mentioned, different currencies in life, all of them are important. It's like a lot of people ask me, hey, Jimmy, what is the key to success, right? What is the key to success? And I'm thinking, well, it's not just one key, right? A lot of people think, well, if I make 10 million or 20 million or whatever it is, I'm going to be successful. Well, I know a lot of people who make a lot of money and it doesn't necessarily make them feel incredible, yeah. right? There are other things that are important in life. You think that million or two or 10 million will solve your problems couldn't be further from the truth, right? So there's not just one key. Um, it's kind of like, you know, those lockers you use for a suitcase, right? Like the, the best ones, they have like combination of five digits. This is what it's like for me, in my, my view. You don't want just one key. You want a couple of different elements in there. One of the digits could be, for instance, yes, financial success. Finances are important. They're not everything, but they certainly make life easier. You can hire more people, you have more freedom. You can help your parents to explore the world. You can do so many different things. You can donate to animal shelters and orphanages, plenty of options with money, but then you have, free, you have freedom, you have mobility, you have your friends and family, you have your health, you have your mindfulness. Um, and I feel like nowadays there's a lot of message being pushed out there. It's like, show no emotion, grind all the time, don't sleep. Sleep is for those who are broke. I completely disagree with that message, man. Because ultimately, you know, we're all gonna die one day and. Uh, you know, some people say, well, you know, life is not here to enjoy. It's not about the journey. It's about the result. I'm like, well, but the moment you get that result and becomes the present moment. So now you're chasing another result. Like, what is the point? Where is it going to end? So I'm a big believer in living life holistically. Um, to me, you know, and I, I really feel like this is so important. Everyone should define success for themselves. You know, what does success mean to you? For one person, being successful may mean you know, living on a beautiful island, having a nice house, a bunch of horses running around, some chickens, right? And just living a, a relaxed life, reading books and maybe writing and, and that's it, that's it. Not having a private jet, not going all over the world. For another person, success may be having the freedom to explore the entire planet, mm -hmm. right? For another person, success may be having a massive family, 10 kids or 12 kids, right? So everyone is different. And I feel like oftentimes we listen to, to those preachers who tell us, hey, hustle mode, go after it, without really considering what do I really want? Like, what do I want? Do I really want to have a company exit and make 10 million? Or do I just want to make 10K per month so I can pay my bills, so I can pay for my travels, so I can support my favorite charities and not worry about money? 
right? For some people, maybe even less than that. For some people, maybe more. But mm -hmm. you got to define it for yourself. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I want to add a few more points to that, Jimmy. And people who are watching, they might find it useful. I personally believe that your success is defined by the, by the values that you have. And if you have clarity on those, which many people don't have, they don't know their values, right? Mm -hmm. If you have the clarity on your values, then you can find out uh, the proper definition of your success, right? So if I agree you, with you. Yeah. And if you've done it, then you may create a sort of web diagram. I think they call it web diagram, where you just get point for every area of your life. For example, if I'm looking about my different areas, it's like health, happiness, my inspiration, relationship, wealth, and all of those. And I kind of point out, okay, out of one to 10, where I am. And then that's a kind of very mathematical, mechanical way to measure success, mm -hmm. but I think it works. Um, yeah, so that's my take on this. I like that. I like that. I agree with that. I feel like anything, there's no right or wrong in terms of arriving at a conclusion in terms of, you know, what it is that you are chasing. So uh, for those people who haven't figured this out yet, I would say, Use different tools. Don't just use one. Use different tools, different exercises. One of the exercises which helped me tremendously is defining your ideal future day, like imagining yourself in the future. How would you want to live your ideal future day? And once you define that, that helps you to actually figure out what you want from life. When I was in Goldman Sachs, I did that exercise. And not knowingly, I sent an email to my friend, Gianluca. I was quite fed up with work. I have to say I had one of my low points in the corporation and I defined in excruciating detail how I'm going to live my life one day. And I, it, it didn't involve anything that had to do with cooperation. I said something in the lines of, man, one day I'm going to live anywhere I want. I'm going to explore the world. I'm going to have a business that helps people. I'm going to help animals. I'm going to support shelters. I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to do this. And man, it's crazy. I realized at some point, hey, everything I'm writing about, I'll never get it if I keep working for a big corporation. But again, that's just a tool, right? There are different tools. I feel like you can never lose by doing an exercise like this, by, as you said, defining your value system, your belief system, you can always gain, you can never lose. So you may as well give it a shot. And if you're watching this and you're not sure about what you want to do, maybe you're stuck in a company or maybe you're stuck in a business you don't like, or maybe you don't know what you want to do at all. Just try a bunch of different things and see what works for you. Everyone is different. Yeah, yeah. I think totally, completely agree. And the top two things that come out for me which are kind of root cause of everything is one is awareness and another one is clarity. Mm -hmm. Clear about things, you are a better decision maker. Uh, and if you are aware of where you are, right, then you, you can achieve a lot with that. 100%. And, and awareness contributes to clarity. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. And Jimmy, you mentioned about your, your career and that you had uh, worked in corporate and it, you didn't connect with it. Now, I'm coming to an important question on that because mm -hmm. now you speak in Fortune 500 companies. The people who listen to you have multiple years of experience doing whatever they're doing. And you've come from somewhere who have worked in corporates only for a year or two. And you give them lectures and, you know, make them do something and you kind of successfully do it. Do you ever feel that as an imposter there? Because you personally don't have that much of experience to the people you're teaching, right? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that, if at all it comes up? That, that's that's a really good question. This is probably um, one of the one of the most interesting podcast questions. Thank you. Because because it sounds it sounds like a tricky question, but it's not. And the simple answer is no. I don't feel like an imposter. Simple reason is that first of all, results, and the second thing, I don't teach corporates about their jobs. I mm. teach them about what I do. Right. So I think a lot of people get it wrong. Right. A lot of people think, oh. You, you go, you speak in that corporation and you speak to managers and there's a CEO in the audience and that person has 20 years of experience. How can you do it? You are in your 30s. Um, but again, you're not teaching them about what they do in their business. You're teaching them about your area of expertise. So when you combine that with having a solid track record, right? Having ratings, being invited back, you know, people paying you very high fees to get you on board, you realize clearly you're doing something well. Now, right. if at some point, Right? But of course, it's important to have an open mind and of course, be self-critical sometimes. But this is how I perceive it, right? If at some point I do a gig or two and I get really bad feedback and then I do a speech and again, ratings are really low and say my courses start getting bad ratings, that's when I know, okay, maybe this is not what I should be doing. Perhaps there is no market for me. Maybe people don't want to watch this. But I feel like, and this is, I feel like this is very valuable for anyone 
who experiences an imposter syndrome, especially in this field of the field of training, going out there, whether it's corporate training or consulting or coaching, remember about this, right? This is so important. If you create results, this is what matters. If 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 you can't say, let's say you're 37 years, years old and you are consulting a CEO or maybe a group of you know C-suite executives, and they are all 50 plus, and you get them results. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. It doesn't matter even what your experience is. If you bring the results, that's it. You're killing it, right? So I'll give you some examples, like real examples from literally the last few months. I went to the US to present for this company called Chemours. Chemours is a huge chemical company. They've got like six and a half, seven thousand employees. So they flew me in, right? I did like multiple stuff for them. And you may ask, okay, chemical company, do you have a degree in chemistry? No. I don't, right? I have a degree in international business and management, not chemistry, right? Um, so then a person may, may think, how could you teach them? Well, I was teaching them about, actually, funny, funnily enough, they asked me to teach them about overcoming the imposter syndrome and building authentic confidence, wow. right? And I spun it with an angle of how to present yourself in a company, how to speak to groups of people with confidence, with charisma, how to communicate better, right? This is my area of expertise. I taught a lot of people online and offline, right? With, with, with results, tangible results. So I did that. Another example, um, a company called Westpac. It's a massive bank in Australia, 40,000 employees. So it got me to give a presentation about resilience. Now, again, I was in Goldman Sachs. That was a long time ago. I'm not an expert in banking. In fact, you know, if you told me now to read some books about banking, I, that would bore me. This is not what I want to do. That's why I'm not working there anymore. But I wasn't talking to them about banking. I was teaching them about resilience. They take into account my experience, my knowledge, but also including my short experience in an investment bank. So on the one hand, you know, I have my knowledge, my experiences, my tools that worked in many different industries, but I know the realities of banking industry. So I can resonate with them and they relate to me. They're like, Okay, at least this guy knows a little bit what we are going through here, right? So there's a connection. Final example, recent one, maybe two, two weeks ago, I was given a presentation. It's called Lion Corporation, right? It's a, it's a beverage company, Southeast Asia. They own multiple bever beverage brands. I think they've got around 7,000 employees, something like that, really big company, right? And again, beverage company. What do I know about beverages? I rarely even drink alcohol. I, man, I drink water. I drink just water or freshly squeezed juice occasionally. I absolutely hate soft sugar drinks. Never do that. Sometimes a bit of good wine or a very cold beer if it's extremely hot. So I don't know much about beverages, right? But again, I was doing a presentation, I should say a workshop about productivity, mm. right? So I don't have to. So again, these are real life examples, but, but there's a distinction, right? And I, that's why I feel like a lot of us have an imposter because we, we feel like we have to be great at everything. No, you don't. You, no one is. You don't have to be great at everything. You have to be great at what you do. And this is what is important. And if you do something and you get results, great. Just keep going. Don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen. Someone could tell you, someone could tell you, oh man, you, you know, what you're, what you're doing is bullshit. You shouldn't be doing this. You are not qualified. Hey, if your client who just paid you, let's say $20,000, tells you, hey, listen, uh, Jacqueline, you completely nailed it. People loved it. Thank you so much. Your, strat your branding strategy for our company is already helping us tremendously to save money. Thank you so much. Who would you rather listen to? Would you rather listen to a person who paid you 20 k for that consulting gig or some random hater who clearly has so much free time? Because <laughs> guess what? People who are successful are not hating, right? I know so many incredible people out there who are successful. They are not haters. Like, you know, Vishen, right? I'm very good friends with Vishen. Vishen never speaks badly about people. Why? He doesn't have the time, he, right? He is too busy living his incredible life. The same thing applies to so many other people out there. If you are living an epic life, if you're aligned with your vision, with your mission, with your value, with your belief system, you have no time to judge others, to hate, to argue. No, you're too busy living your best life. So, so for those of you watching this, if you are an aspiring consultant, coach, speaker, whatever it is, and I, I'm saying this because I know that a lot of people that watch your podcast, they want to get into that world. Don't listen to haters. No, no, don't, don't listen to them. 
listen to constructive criticism. It is important. We can always learn from it. To this day, whenever I give a speech, even when people tell me, hey, you did really well, I'm like, I appreciate it. Thank you. But you know what I do? I ask the organizer right away. I did this on Mind Valley as well at AFS right away. I'm like, hey, Tina, can you please send me the recording? I got to see it. And it's never comfortable, right? But I watch it and I ask myself, okay, man, okay, what could have been better? What could have been better? I'm like, this joke worked well, but this one, uh, I pushed it a bit too much, right? Or the audience interaction, uh, maybe I pushed them a little bit too much here, or right? So you always want to learn from feedback. Whenever someone tells me, hey, man, I have some constructive feedback for you, I love it because a lot of people are not willing to do it. I, I sit down and I, I'm going to listen. I'm going to even get them a dinner, right? It's, it's awesome. I love to get constructive feedback, but there's a big difference between constructive feedback and just random comments, pure hate. Mm. And by the way, final thing I'm going to mention here, um, usually when someone is a hater, they secretly hate themselves. They, and, and you remind them of something that they would want to do. I noticed that this is often the case. Um, so when something like this happens to me, and it doesn't happen much, but sometimes, you know, those things happen. I try to, I try to feel compassion. Mm -hmm. For instance, you know, I, and you know this, you, you have a podcast, you post clips. Here and there, occasionally, you may get a weird comment. Somebody may comment on whatever, right? Hateful comments. It happens to everyone. If it doesn't happen, well, actually, let me put it this way. When it starts happening, it means you're on the right path because right. you're getting enough reach. Mm -hmm. When it happens, um, I laugh. I usually don't even see those comments. My assistant sees them, but sometimes I'm curious. I go in there and some of those YouTube comments are so funny that I laugh so hard, right? I, I feel like it's important you know, to, to laugh at those things. And uh, if someone is getting really vicious, mm. remind yourself that probably the reason they are doing it is because secretly their lives are not going the way they want them to go. They have a lot of pain in them. And when you approach it from the position of compassion, everything changes. You feel much better. You suddenly don't worry too much about other people not approving of what you are doing. And at the same time, yes, you feel that compassion. It really fills you. And you see that other person for just a fragile human being, right? Totally. Agree. I went to a bit of a rant here, man. No, I, that's fine. I took your question and I just realized <laughs> I went, I went like this and then I went here. <laughs> and it made total sense, uh, Jimmy. And you know what? Hurt people hurt people. Uh, I think it's in one of the book uh, yeah. by... You can heal your life by, I forgot the name of the author, uh, but yeah, hurt people, hurt people. And you know, Vishen's new book, uh, which is about the sixth faith phase meditation. So those of you, I mean, he's already given a lot of detail about how the meditation works, but one of the steps is to, is to forgive. And when you are having a situation like this, if somebody's writing a comment that's, uh, that's making you feel bad, just go into their situation, try to stand there and see, you know, what kind of background they're coming from. Right? And then you will realize that, okay, it's not their fault. They're hurt. I mean, they have been programmed in such a way. So you will then forgive them and you will kind of say, okay, bless you. <laughs> That's what I do. If somebody says something negative to me, I just bless them. Yeah, I, I love that. 100%. But uh, let me add something. This is important while we're already talking about it. And I, I, I like the way this is going, right? I mean, I like um, what those podcasts, they... They, they go various directions. We, we don't have like a clear structure we have to follow. We, we kind of go with the energy uh, between us now. Um, forgiving other people is important, but it's even more important to forgive yourself. Oh, and this is awesome. so important. And remember, did I, did I do, I think I did this at AFEST actually, now that I think about it. Sometimes I do it. I, yeah, I did that. I asked everyone to stand up, right? And I said, and I said to people, stand up and sit down on me if in the last two weeks you haven't felt any fear, any anxiety, any self-doubt, any limiting belief, right? Otherwise, keep standing. Man, everyone kept standing. I think there's one or two people who, who sat down. You should make a podcast with those people. <laughs> what is the secret? What is the secret, right? Um, you know, but, but listen, I mean, everyone kept standing. Why? Because everyone struggles. And I feel like oftentimes the reason I do it is I want to remind people that, yes, it's not just you. It's not just you. Mm. And... Oftentimes we think it's just us and we secretly hate ourselves because of something we did or something we didn't do. Yeah. I didn't invest in Bitcoin early enough or I didn't talk to that person and I lost an opportunity or I didn't start my podcast until now, whatever it is. Uh, and I feel like oftentimes we, it's important to have high standards for yourself, but I feel like we are taking it to a completely different twisted level where 
we expect so much from ourselves that secretly we literally hate ourselves. And the moment you, you decide, you, okay, I'm going to forgive myself, right? I, I mean, you can't fix the past, but you can create new past because you actually create past by the things you're doing now. Whatever you, but people get it wrong. People think your past creates your future. Actually, when you really think about it, your present creates your past because whatever I'm doing right now, I'm talking to you and I'm going to say the, I'm going to say the word one, one. That's past now. Now it's the past. It's already in the past. Yeah. I use a word one. That word is already in the past. Well, this is a random basic example, but whatever we do right now mm. creates the past. So this is why I feel like it's important to look in the mirror deeply into your eyes and, and, and just forgive yourself. And you may have to write those things down and then burn that piece of paper. There are different product goals. We don't have the time to go deep into all of the different variations. But yeah. when you truly forgive yourself, the burden is released, then it's easier to forgive other people. And it's also easier to, to move forward. And actually, the reason I mentioned that exercise I do with people, making them stand up is because the moment you recognize that no matter who you are, everyone struggles, even people you admire, right? All those best-selling authors and even Elon Musk and people like that, they have their own struggles. In fact, a lot of struggles. There are people out there like Robin Williams who committed suicide because they, they had their own issues. And there are plenty of people like this. We talked before about imposter syndrome. Michelle Obama mentioned herself that she had imposter syndrome. Maya Angelou, who wrote, what, 11 or 12 best-selling books, she said at one point, you know, whenever I publish a new book, I'm kind of waiting for the moment they're going to find out that I'm playing a game on them, right? Mm -hmm. Plenty of examples. David Bowie said, like, they kept creating to kind of suppress that feeling of being inadequate. And I could keep giving you examples for another hour. Mm -hmm. And I experienced this myself, by the way. And so, but once we realize that everyone struggles, suddenly, and everyone makes mistakes, suddenly us making mistakes and us struggling, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem like, it doesn't make us those terrible people in our own eyes. Suddenly we realize, okay, this is happening to me because I'm a human like everyone else. Yes, it is fine. It is normal that I make mistakes. Let's move on. Let me forgive myself for whatever happened. Let me let me open the blank page. Let me design my new reality. Let me figure out where I want to be and actually start crafting it word by word, sentence by sentence. And then you write your own script for your, for your life. Writing your own script for life uh, might be a long task, but let's talk about writing a script, script for your speech. Um, before that, Jimmy, you're okay with time? You're already... Bro, this is, this is great. You're reading my mind. I was about to tell you, I have literally just a few minutes. Because I have a, I'm doing a speech in, at 6 p.m. Okay, what time is it there? Well, I tell you what, I'm, I'm enjoying this. I'm happy to do part two at some other time with you and go deeper into it. Okay, so, so Jimmy, thank you very much for such a great insight. I really wanted to dig deep into the skip, uh, public speaking side of your business because that's what you do so well. You are one of the most charismatic speaker I have seen, seriously. Uh, so I appreciate it, thank you. In the interest of time, I will ask you one question, which I ask all my guests, which is what, according to you, are the top three skills that one needs in order to live a happy and successful and fulfilled life, but schools are not teaching? Uh -huh, okay. I was about to say, it's a, it's a very tough question because it's very broad. The moment you said that schools don't teach those skills, now it became easier. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep this fairly concise. As you know, in the next seven minutes, I'm doing, I'm actually doing a speech for a university. So this is quite oh. relevant. There's this, um, University of Connecticut in the US. I'm doing a speech for them um, live. Okay, free skills. Okay, there are a lot of different skills, but number one, uh, we talked about a little bit already, so I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but teaching kids that you don't just have to accept this predictable life path, but you can actually design the life that you wanna live. And you, you, you have to figure out for yourself where you wanna be, you have to find your vision, you have to figure it out, and then based on that, you reverse engineer. So a lot of people have a misconception that, well, your past told you got to be a doctor, you got to be a, you got to be a, um, a, I don't know, an, an engineer or whatever it is. You feel like that's what you have to do because you feel that pressure. I feel like we have to tell the kids, ultimately, it is up to you. And rather than thinking that certain fields will bring you more money than the other, you have to accept the simple fact that a lot of people don't understand that if you are good at anything, if you're really great at anything, it will bring you money. I don't care what it is. If you love plants and you love growing plants, you can make millions on that. You can just, you know, it, it's incredible the, the number of opportunities out there. So rather than picking things just because of how much money they can possibly bring you, figure out what you actually want to do with your life. So teaching kids, figure out where you want to be 
And then based on that, we will help you to design the plan of action, certain subjects you should study, right? Certain experiences you should have. Number two, I would say building confidence, teaching them about confidence, anything that has to do with it. So how to feel more, better, more comfortable in your own skin, how to alleviate anxiety when it shows up. That's another thing, but also emotional control. Mm -hmm. So important. Imagine how many school shootings we would avoid if we were teaching kids about that. If you're telling kids from early on, listen, Sometimes you may not feel the best. Sometimes you may feel like your life doesn't make sense. Here's how you manage that feeling, right? Vulnerability is powerful, right? Sometimes you have to tell people how you feel about something. Teaching kids about that, imagine how many issues we would avoid. Teaching kids what to do when they feel angry. Oh, you want to punch the other kid. Well, here is what's happening. Here is how you manage it, right? These are some of the most important skills. So, you know, building belief in yourself, building that confidence and, and uh, emotional control, very important. And then I'll say, finally, being productive, actually doing the right things. Because, okay, number one thing we, we talked about, well, finding your vision and figure out the, pl the plan of action. Okay, great. So you know where you want to be and you create some type of plan of action. You design your life in a certain way. Cool. You now need confidence to get there. Okay, so you teach them confidence, emotional control. For instance, how to control your emotions when you have to speak in public, very important. But then finally, if you really want to get there, you have to optimize. As I mentioned before during the interview, you can't just treat everything as equally important. You have to be very smart about what is important and what is not important. So teaching mm -hmm. kids about productivity, teaching them that you know, it's not enough just to go through the motions, teaching them that, no, sometimes doing something for 40 minutes well can bring you more results than half-assing something for four hours. Yeah. Right? But then we need to redesign the entire school system rather than, hey, you sit on your ass for 45 minutes and then you have a break and you have to sit on the wooden uncomfortable chair that is killing your back, right? Literally destroying your spine. We have to redesign everything. But listen, I have to, I have to run. Literally, I'm starting in, in two minutes. I enjoy this conversation a lot. I, I, I love your energy. You're a very good interviewer. More than happy to continue this at some other point. Then we can go deeper into public speaking and to some of the specifics. You want to ask me before about you know how I design my speeches. More than happy to share more about this next time. Okay, let's do it again then. Thank you very much for these three answers. I love that defining your life path and do reverse engineering. That's one of the best answer I've got. I've interviewed 70 people and I've asked the same question to everybody. This one stands out. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Oh, wow. And thank you very much for your time. You've given so much of value to my audience. I really appreciate it. AJ, thank you so much, man. This was great. I, I really enjoy your energy, the, the positivity, the professionalism as well. You know, the way, the way we set it up, the way, you know, you want to make sure the recording, the quality is, is the best. And all, all, of, all of the things we talked about, I appreciate that. Let's do it again, man. We're going to go even deeper. Thank you. And thank by the way, thanks to everyone watching this. I, I appreciate you. You know, I think both of us, we don't take your time lightly. We know that you could be doing a thousand different things and you invested this time to listen to us out of all the other people out there. So we do appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Guys, if you're looking to know more about Jimmy's work, I'll put all the links down here. And if you have not yet done so, then this is the time to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so that you get notification to all our future videos. I will see you again next week. Until then, you take care and keep learning.